All right, everybody, if you're watching this video, it's too late. It's over. The supercharger is already removed. Um, so I'm going to go through. It's going to be kind of like a two-fold video. Uh, the first one is just kind of continuing the documentation on the car, trying to sell it because nobody wants it. And then secondly, going over the supercharger installation in reverse. Um, unfortunately, I don't know how to make a video backwards. You're just going to have to fast forward to the parts you need if you're looking to install a supercharger system. And then most importantly, I'm going to go over every little issue that I had with this um, system. Every little um, hardware problem, fitment error um directions that weren't too clear so you you won't have the same issues that i did hopefully so with that said uh we're gonna get started at removing the supercharger because i got a couple buyers that are interested in the kit um usually it's like a ten thousand dollar ish kit um depending on your options um I'll, I'll probably offer it up for sale for half maybe six grand maybe five grand i don't know something like that it's only got six thousand miles on it um, ran fine. The oil is uh, still, you know, perfectly clear. This stuff, I think, usually goes 30k or whatever. Uh, so step one: remove the uh, automatically removing, self-removing uh, supercharger belt. You can see this is already off. Um, yeah. So the new buyer is going to get a. Uh, nice new belt it's normally 40 50 bucks it's already been modified in the last video we cut it we cut two ribs off uh, so yeah we'll start with the piping and go from there so step one or the final step if you're installing this kit is the piping now a couple things these worm gear clamps here should only be used on the non pressurized side so I've seen kits where people use all T-bolt T -bolt clamps, and that's kind of unnecessary. The other issue is that if you're installing T-bolt clamps, they have a higher likelihood of crushing or breaking your uh, pipe, um, which is something I learned that we'll, we'll go into. Um, but typically all your vacuum side or your intake side piping uh, should just be worm gear clamps. Except on the supercharger, that's a T-bolt because this is a very difficult connection. And if you use a worm gear clamp, you're going to strip it. It's going to come loose. Or uh, whatever you want to call it. Now, I've seen photos of this blow-off valve being straight. Uh, I don't know how that's possible. Maybe... I did something wrong, or maybe it's not an ISF thing where that fits perfectly straight, but I found the piping to be very um, tight in this corner. I'll show you this little, where this lines up with this pipe. We'll kind of go into that. But let me do these T-bolts here so we can get moving on, getting some of the stuff off. Um, the blow off valves themselves, the, the uh, adjustment, the directions actually said to adjust it because you screw you basically screw this in screw it out for more or less um, not blow off but the uh, the ability to release air so you should loosen this and it's this is in the directions there's actually an o-ring here uh, let's see here we'll take this off oh, maybe there's not an o-ring I don't know if they're supposed to be an O-ring. Maybe they meant... Uh, I remember seeing O-ring. It basically said loosen it to the first O-ring or groove. Maybe it was groove. just don't remember it correctly. So there's just a groove here. That's where you want to basically start on your blow off valve adjustments uh, to get the right amount of vacuum release. Um, here is our... Reservoir, it's all self-contained, the supercharger fluid, uh, what are you going to call it, the oil. Um, the other thing, the issue with these pipes I found, 
It would have been really nice if the pipes had uh, a lip on them because then you could actually use worm gears everywhere. You wouldn't have to use T-bolt clamps and torque them to like, you know, just shy of crushing the pipe. If there was some kind of lip that would hold the silicone tube on, that would be better. This is my opinion. I don't know how hard it is to get a lip on a carbon uh, pipe like this, but so here's your assembly. And again, like I said, let me take this part off. The alignment for me was difficult to get this nice and uh, uniform. I mean, I guess you could do it like that with uh, but then the problem is, look at look where this is. So I don't know if I cut too much off this 90 degree. That didn't allow it to come up further here. But I feel like even if you did that, just this angle is not ideal to get uh, a pipe on here. Like, so this is directly in line with the engine. Um, so this has an adapter, obviously, for your piping. This just screws on and off. I don't know what other thing you'd screw on there. Different size maybe or a smaller size. So that's one. I don't know if the system needs two. I've rarely heard of uh, big boost cars in the Mitsubishi world that had two blow-off valves. Uh, but I think it's for responsiveness from what I remember our racing saying. Or something like that. But they fit fine. I mean one here, one there. So no issues with that. I'm going to keep all the parts in a box so I can just hand it to the new buyer. Keep everything organized. All right, you might see my poverty pack um, catch can here. And this is just half inch heater hose that fits perfectly in the factory PCV um, rubber hose here. You can gently just clamp it on. And then half inch here, if this might be bigger, it looks a little bit bigger, although we'll look when it comes off. And then there's just a one-way valve right here, cheap one-way valve, five bucks or whatever. And uh, actually, this can has never filled up for me, ever. There's nothing in here, there's never been anything in here, which is kind of nice. Just goes to show the car wasn't really pushed hard, and it's got good... Um, ring sealing, it doesn't have a lot of blow-by, nothing like that. And this, uh, I don't know if I'm going to leave this on or not. I'll probably just put it back to stock for the, the next guy. Because I'm sure they don't want to see a $10 eBay catch can on the car. Okay. Good. This, like, white powder on all the coolant hoses is normal. It happens on all my newer Toyotas. I don't know exactly what it is or why it powder appears on everything like that. If anyone knows, let me know. I don't know if it's something in the rubber they use nowadays, or the newer Toyotas at least, you know, post 2005 or 6 or whatever, that has just that powder. Okay, we got all that off. Straightforward there. Now for the fun pipe here. It's just a super tight angle and fit because you're fighting with multiple things here. Oh, the other thing is I think you have to take off, you have to take off this T-bolt clamp uh, entirely so it'll clear the uh, fender because the fitment is so tight between the supercharger inlet and the fender that even the T-bolt clamp you can't squeeze out of there. So always put your nuts on your clamps. Don't want to lose them. And now the pipe comes off. So a couple things you can see. There's some scuff marks here because it comes so close to uh, the supercharger bracket. You can see the bracket's a little bit worn down. Just the paint right here because this is just such a tight fitment. Again, I, I don't know if that's how it's supposed to be, but that's just how it fits for me. 
And then you can see here just how insanely close, uh, it's maybe a quarter inch. It's not, it's not like right touching it or anything, but. And then there's our nice fins on the supercharger, spin freely perfectly. All good there, no big deal. And another part here, and then here's your transition. I think it's three to three and a half or something like that. Just reference. Okay. Now we can, we're gonna have to separate this elbow, this 90 degree elbow from the, um, the MAF pipe and the air filter. And then we'll have to access that from down below, which I'm not looking forward to removing the under tray and everything, but now I recall how tedious that was. And a few notes. So that's that pipe again. Like it's gonna touch stuff. This comes so close to like the headlight and the ballast and all that stuff. It's just inevitable that you're gonna get some contact like that. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, I decided in the past few weeks that I'm leaving the air fuel uh, gauge, I'm leaving the fuel pressure um, sensor, not sensor, the sender here, and I'm leaving the surge tank with the pump because it also includes a regulator on it. I'm also leaving the 660 injectors. They're Denso injectors, so they're factory. It's not like they're Chinese injectors that they're gonna break or not work. The reason is uh, because the tune on the ECU is uh, set up for, it basically it eliminates the rear cat uh, codes. So because the car has PPE headers, it's going to throw codes with a stock um, stock uh, tune and everything. And I don't want to sell a car that has um, a check engine light. And I'm not putting stock headers back on, if that makes sense. Because normally, I mean, people want PPE headers. It's a nice, it's a nice upgrade that's kind of stockish. So that's it. And the benefit, I, I thought about removing the surge tank, which is in the trunk. It's nicely installed. But then I would have to buy an adjustable fuel pressure regulator to put in the engine bay. And the reason I would have to do that is because the bigger injector is one, uh, the tune, and you cannot run... Um, E85 or 93 if you eliminate the, the fuel pressure regulator. So the fuel pressure regulator is on the surge tank. I'm leaving it so the next person can uh, adjust the fuel pressure depending upon if they want to run E85 or 93 octane. So there's some things that just can't be put back to stock due to convenience or lack of convenience. So I'm just going to give the, uh, the mods away. And a fuel pressure regulator costs almost as much as the surge tank, the, the radium surge tank. So I figure with the labor and all that, I'll just leave it. So I, don't, I don't need it. And if the next buyer wants to do nitrous, turbo kit, different supercharger kit, same supercharger kit, Whatever, it's the fuel system's all set up and it runs like stock. So, yeah, I mean, it is what it is. I get why some people might not want it like that and they want a perfectly stock car, but for the most part, it is a stock car or it will be after this. Okay, our T bolt clamps are off. And actually, this one does have a lip on it. So technically you probably could get away with the hose clamp, a regular one, but due to the location, um, you're going to want T-bolt, I guess. There's some visible, like, cracking in there. It's not really cracking, it's kind of maybe just how the, uh, the mold was done. I don't know if any of this will chip off and then get into the engine or not. I don't know, but after 6,000 miles, this is kind of 
what you're looking at. So that's off. Let's pull this one off here, inspect everything. And this is actually metal. You can see it's painted and then it's kind of flaking off right there. And this also has a lip. So some of these do have lips. And then I would assume, it's been so long since I put this on. I would assume that the, uh, the intake side does not have any lips because it doesn't need it. So that's that. This one again is set right to that little groove in there. Parts file. And I think, I feel like I'm going to leave the crank pulley on too. The ATI, fluid damper, whatever. Uh, I might as well just leave it on because, you know, harmonics. I just, I just don't want to do a lot of work. And I don't really want to even, it's not even worth it to take it apart and then sell the, uh, sell the part to recoup the money and all that kind of stuff. It's just... Blah. Cut my losses, as they say. All right, so most of that piping we'll have to do from the bottom. Um, next, we can actually remove the supercharger. Four bolts here. Let me see if I can get a better angle. Uh, basically, two here, two here. I went over this on the last video on how to basically remove the supercharger, drop it down, put the belt on, and then lift everything up. Let me go find that uh, hex socket size. Okay, I found a beautiful angle here for the mount. This is a five millimeter hex. Um, be careful with these, these bolts, these four bolts. For some reason, they kind of easily strip if you're not careful. You're gonna need an extension probably on this last one in the right, little, 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 lower left corner. I think it took maybe, I don't know, I took my time last time when I installed it. I don't know how many hours exactly it took me, but it's basically a few different phases. It's going to be the bumper phase with the intercooler, and the piping phase, and we're already leaking out of here a little bit. Um, yeah, so, I don't know. It's unfortunate, but sometimes you just got to move on. The other thing we got to do, we got to loosen. There's a ten, another ten millimeter T bolts holding the outlet pipe on the supercharger. This one's down right here. You do simple um, deep ten millimeter socket. We'll get that one off. No big deal. That should be good. Now loosen it by hand. One, two, three. Uh, the wrong one again. Four, boom. Goes in the parts pile. And the next lucky buyer. So this, let me see if I had, yes. So this, I don't know if we're going to be able to clear this in the current form because it's such a tight fit between the fender and the bracket. So that's another thing, like you can't really remove things easily without removing a whole lot of other things. It's another little slight uh, critique about this kit. It's just you're stuffing a ton of stuff and just Tiny amount of space. T bolt clamp still getting any problems. Let me get this off. Okay, you can rotate the supercharger this way. Sneak it out of there. Put that in parts pile for the next buyer. And we'll carry on. Now, let me. Angle this down a bit. Can't really see too much, but I wished the first um, kit I got, I had the wrong S-pipe. So this S-pipe right here that goes that way and then into the supercharger, 
I got the wrong one. So I was trying to like make it fit and force it. And long story short, I had to send it back and some other parts just because nothing fit right. And it turns out I got the wrong pipe. So that's okay. Um, I think we can leave all that. The other thing I wish um, was available was some kind of a template to drop in here so you know how much to sheet metal to cut for all this to fit. You're kind of on your own. I just wish there was something you could drop in here, mark, and then that's basically your, your template to cut out. So, yeah. I think uh, we're almost ready to jack it up now. We'll move the under tray and start working down there. Uh, but we will remove this bracket here. One, two, one, two. Which will just leave us with the main frame portion. And then here's the tensioner. I didn't have any problems with this one. I don't know if there's a newer one or not, but this is what came on the original kit. So, yeah, let's jack it up. All right, under tray removal. Uh, I'm not gonna bore everyone with this, but it's just simply a bunch of 10 millimeter bolts slash uh, screws. Bolts that look like screws. So, just make sure not to mix them up. All that good stuff. So, all right. After a bunch of screws came out, so did the under tray. I'm gonna leave that down there. And look at the good stuff in here. Let's reposition this. And we can see now the kit included uh, these giant zip ties. I forget exactly what they were for, but I found it to be pretty useful here in holding this pipe away from the pulleys. Because without it, uh, I've had this pipe contact the bottom pulley here, the red pulley above, and it's just a whole lot of no, not fun stuff. So I'll stick a zip tie there. And that'll hold your intercooler piping. Now the bottom looks like this. A couple Allen screws there with some spacers here. Looks like two, two large and then a, a small spacer is what the instructions specified. As you can see, so it's a nice visual reference of what spacers go where, because you get a whole bag of spacers. Um, and then there's like a, a whole spacer here, and then up above it's like two shorter spacers and then a small tiny one in the middle. But we'll go through what each hole needs as far as spacers. And here's the lovely beautiful ATI Super Damper. Um, my front cover seal is... Oops still good it's not leaking anything which is always good to see uh, when i did the timing chains and the tensioners and everything that's all all knocked out everything's nice and clean under here electric power steering so there's no power steering fluid obviously um so the next step and you've noticed i didn't touch the radiator yet uh we'll get to that i don't remember if I even did the first time around or not. We'll see. So let me get this bracket off and stop yapping and we'll go from there. Okay, six millimeter Allen on these. Here. Let's not break any knuckles. I'm gonna have to find the original timing cover bolts, obviously to put the regular bolts back in but the uh, the sealant is what actually seals the oil in not the bolts in case you were wondering but they're just short little stubby factory bolts same as like these three here uh, it's just a matter of finding what box I put in put them in and where that ended up but nothing real spectacular here 
I'm gonna take these out and I'll be back when they're out. Okay, I got everything loosened up. So we're gonna start in this lower left corner here. You've got one. The other thing is, why, why can't we use better hardware? Like stainless or something, I know it costs more, but just, I mean, rusting after however long. Anyways, not a big deal. Here's our spacers. So we've got one long, I'm going to call this long. And then I did this small in the middle, and then the final long, like that. So that's our lower left corner. Lower right corner. We've got similar setup. We've got, now this is where it gets tricky, because we've got a long. Now this shorter one is actually shorter than the last one. It's a different length. So it's shorter, and then that's your long again. We'll do a, we'll a close-up when they're all off next to each other. This one above the lower left corner here. Short one. Let's get back up there. And that has a long, like so, which is the same long as all the other ones. And then finally up here, this one's pretty tight actually. All these spacers are stuck on the, yeah, they're stuck. Um, so I'm going to have to, I forgot about a bolt kind of in the middle that holds the bracket to another spot. So I'll just stick this back in temporarily, and then we'll have to loosen that one. So I'm going to have to lower the car down again. Okay, we've got above that red pulley, you see that nut and a stud? Uh, I think that's 14, it might be 17, I don't remember, let me see. But that has to come off next. Uh, the stud, you have to remove the radiator hose unfortunately but the nut I think I can get off without it so let me grab a wrench for that all right we've got the nut off it was 14 millimeter like I suspected uh, but there's still one more bolt further up that's holding this whole assembly in so like I thought we're gonna have to go back up lower the car down take it off but before we do that let me show you the bolts so here's what we got. Here's the short one with the spacer that's the same as these. Here's your top long one. And this has actually two shorter medium size maybe. It's bad lighting, terrible. Can't see anything. Okay, and then here's your two other ones. One's longer than the other, keep that in mind, otherwise nothing's going to fit right. One has this longer, small spacer, one has a shorter, small spacer. So that's that. Keep those all together with that nut and a little of the card out. Here is our final bolt, 6 millimeter again. This is going to loosen the supercharger bracket entirely from the engine. You may hear the coolant draining. It's because we have reached the point of inability to get any further. We need that uh, water inlet out. We need the hose out in order to clear the bracket to get that out of there. So the coolant's got to come out, unfortunately. This radiator outlet or this hose was somewhere else. I guess you could probably install this whole system without even touching the radiator. But we shall see as we go further into the rabbit hole. This also has spacers, so I'm going to carefully get those out so they don't drop into the abyss. The thunderstorms all day on this fine evening. So the air is cool and crisp. Here's our final bolts uh, right here. That is also the same length as these others. Uh, so you'll see this spacer then is the same as this one over here. And I've mixed them all up so I don't really remember what went where, but so hopefully you do. Uh, so this is the top one that we just removed here. 
Okay, good. Now our supercharger bracket is loose and can be removed from the engine bay. The only problem now is that water pipe, like I mentioned. So once the uh, coolant is drained, you can get down in there, remove the pipe, and get that off. And there's another spacer behind the stud, which we will investigate once we get that off. But that's a larger one. So up we go. All right, our coolant is drained. Now we're going to remove this lower pipe hose so we can remove that supercharger bracket. Inevitably, there's going to be coolant in here. So we got to hold up our bucket and very carefully. Oh, not that bad. Do that. Keep that hose clamp. Perfect. Now I need a needle nose to get this clamp up here. So give me a second. Alright. I got my trusty needle nose. Oops. I should invest in an actual hose clamp pliers. I think they make them. It's a little difficult on the forearms. But if you pull with the hose and then pull the clamp at the same time, usually that'll wiggle off like that. Now, if you've made it this far, you could replace this elbow, which comes with a thermostat. It's like a whole inlet assembly type thing. Mine's fine. It's been fine. I didn't replace it last time because uh, I just didn't think I needed it. So that's gone. Now, look at this. We can clear the bracket off of that stud. And then, well, first I gotta remove this pipe, maybe. Yeah, I definitely have to remove this pipe. Okay, so yeah, second. All right, what a wonderful time to talk about more intercooler pipes. So here's another two and a half, I think it's two and a half inch elbow. T-bolt clamps again. And uh, also our air filter is back here with the math and all that. It's all going to fall out. So we'll go through that real quick. I really should have an electric uh, ratchet because this is really obnoxious. I'm sure for the viewers. And there's coolant dripping everywhere for some reason. Alright, let's see what that does. Good enough. Okay, so that's out. Let's make sure it doesn't fall on my face. And this pipe does say ISF on it. There's little stickers, which is good. They don't mix up the parts. Here, this one you can see ISF E R C F F. I think that refers to the pipe locations and numbers. Uh, here's our MAF pipe. Now this is loose. Uh, the MAF plug, which you have to extend. We'll go into that. No big deal there. Now this will just drop out of here, like so. Add it to the parts pile. MAF sensor, we're going to need to swap that over back to OEM. And I did keep all the OEM stuff, of course, because I'm a hoarder. Uh, you may ask why I have a brown 3D printed uh, MAF tube. Um, well, <laughs> I had to bypass the supercharger and then go back to the stock uh, MAF, the stock, all this, basically get this elbow and then just stuck an air filter on here. I put the stock injectors back on the stock tune because the car wouldn't start. Turns out, long story short, it, had, it was an issue with the tune. Um, it, it almost seems like the tune changes itself on this car or after a certain amount of time it'll just not work correctly anymore. I can go more into detail about that if anyone's interested but that's what that is. But now the moment everyone's been waiting for, this will just kind of sneak out of here I believe. Uh, watch that top hose going into the inlet. Yeah look at this beast. The beast is out! 
Wow! So here is your one pulley. This is your grooved pulley. Here's your idler pulley, if you will. The back side of the belt rides on this. It spins around. Here's your tensioner. Uh, this is aluminum, so it's got a little chewed up in the course of trying to tension the belt and put a new belt on hundred times because of uh, fitment issues. But that's what your plate looks like. Backside, just clearance for your alternator pulley in here. Um, other than that, I mean, I think they did some revisions to something. I'm not sure what made this thicker or something with the top bracket. I'm not too sure. But that's it. The supercharger is out. Here is that final stud, which I mentioned. Um, yeah, so this stud gets installed in place of the bolt that was here. But unfortunately, to get this off, you have to remove now the inlet. So I got to remove two the 10 millimeter nuts and bolts, pull the inlet off, get the stud off, and put the factory bolt back in there. No big deal. Um, and then I found my factory bolts for here. I've got one, two, three back into the front cover. So that'll seal that up. And essentially, that's it. The only thing left is the remaining intercooler piping, which we'll have to pull the bumper off to get the intercooler out. And then here you can kind of see what had to be cut on mine to clear this uh, intercooler pipe. So, next step is going to be bumper off, and then uh, we'll go from there. I'm going to assume everyone knows how to take a bumper off. Um, basically, we're going to remove this trim here, a bunch of screws, clips, etc. Um, there is one 10 millimeter screw on each side of the bumper. Um, each side basically in the wheel well where it connects to the fender if you picture the fender here um, I'll just show you it's right here straight up and down you will have to loosen the wheel well arch uh, liner but there's that 10 millimeter screw is right there so here you can see the inner workings of the intercooler mounting again we've got two spacers um, and kind of a, a hex screw bolt thing going on. Uh, let me pull this off. Because we're going to need to remove the grill. Just like so. And again, most of these clips, like, I don't know where they all went. They're somewhere. You know how it goes. Um, okay, so that's the top part of the bumper there. Um, over here you've got, let's keep on going here, we've got some kind of a screw contraption that probably is missing a bushing. And you have these fun little clips. You can see that kind of, no. Keep on going. These fun little clips. Um, now we're almost there. We've got just one more screw on the driver's side. I've already got the passenger side. So now I'm going to take my 10 millimeter with the shortish extension and I'm going to take that last screw out. If I can get you guys over here, not really. You'll have to just trust me on this one. So this final screw you're going to have to Try the wheel well liner back just a little bit. Nothing crazy. You don't have to remove the entire wheel well liner. You don't have to remove the tires, the wheels. None of that. I can see this dumb thing where it's at. There we go. Loosen. I'm kind of a min minimalist when it comes to procedures and repairing stuff. I want to remove the least amount of things possible that's still safe to do so. Okay, probably missing something somewhere. I'll have to refer to some diagrams to see. Oh, it's pretty loose. It looks like it's just held on by 
one more screw that I totally forgot where it is. Probably under the headlight or something crazy. Uh, but let me figure that out and I'll be back. Alright. So I lied. There's these little tabs that run around the perimeter of the bumper. They lock into various clips in the headlight area and under the fender. See these little holes. And once you get that off, the rest is kind of history. This whole thing should just kind of come off and drop down. Look at that. That took a whole five minutes. Here's our intercooler. Here's the modification you have to do to the bumper. We do have one reinforcement left here and one on the driver's side here. Um, fortunately, I don't have the rest of it because I had to cut it. Um, yeah. Uh, well, we're up front and uh, honest about it. Hopefully the, the buyers watched all my videos and saw this because I'm not really hiding anything. It's just what has to be done. Uh, I will actually look into the cost of a replacement. I mean, if I have time while it's apart, you know, why not? Intercooler here, it's pretty big for what it is. But we have these silly hex, uh, these hex screws again. I wish they were just regular, uh, you know, bolts. Hex cap, or I should say these are socket bolts and we need the hex hex tops let me find an extension that works for this um, but first we have to take the t-bolts off again so there's one two three four five down here on this lower and then six right here there's an elbow right there and once i get that done we will start up again all right perfect so i loosened the pipe pulled it forward now i can access the bolts for some reason, the left one is a six millimeter and the right one is a five millimeter. I don't know if that's because I got the wrong size ones or I, I don't know, I don't remember. But one hole is smaller than the other one. So I don't know, take it up with our racing. So this one, this one probably should have had a washer too. It didn't, but that's okay. Held up fine. And we've got one spacer here. I'll leave that there. And actually, I'll put the bolt through it so we don't lose that. Number two. Still tight, of course, because all the weight is on it. And that is one of our horns, so we'll need to replace the bolts. The factory one. It's somewhere around here. Go like that. Boom. Done. Scratched my arm. Nothing new there. Still thundering. Nothing new there. And that's about it, guys. The only other thing, that's too small. The only other thing I gotta kind of talk about is the um, cooler lines. Um, so we have, of course, this is in the way now. Can't see anything. We have the Setrab cooler here. It, oh boy. Oh boy. And our cooler's out. Oh, beefy. Beefy. Cool the air. All right. Uh, Trans Cooler Factory. And then this is our supercharger um, cooler for the line. So obviously we're going to move that. That's going to go with the supercharger. We're going to leave this just as it is. Factory trans cooler. Boom. I'm going to price out this crash bar. Get a new one. Slap her on. Put the bumper back on. Bob's your uncle. So that's it. What else we got? Uh, got to put the factory wheels back on because nobody wants these slicks. Mickey Thompson's. And other than that, I think it's ready to go. I am going to show everybody the fuel pressure situation, how to adjust it for 93 octane or 85, E85. Still got the engine cover, never sold that. 
and uh, I'll probably cover putting the factory intake stuff back on. We'll start it up and I'll show you, you know, how easy it is to at least uninstall the supercharger. But hopefully you saw how easy it was also to install your own. Okay, on to the crank pulley. This is the fun part. So here you see the factory dampener here. And it's got this giant weight in the front and then the grooved pulley portion in the rear. Well, the problem is the Lexus tool for normal V8s um, is supposed to drop in here and then you're supposed to secure it to those two bolt holes. But the one off the shelf is not deep enough to fit inside of this pulley. So recommended um, instructions are to just drop a 3 8 extension into one of these bigger holes and that'll hold the pulley and everything in the crank while you tighten it. <clears throat> Don't quote me. That's just what uh, the process is based on um, online forums and other websites on how to install this pulley or how to remove the original. Um, so this, we'll get into the problem I had with the crank pulley. So. I mentioned earlier I had a few issues with this couple iterations I had to send back and get another one. Well, what had happened was, and by the way, this is a, uh, what are we at here, 8 millimeter. So these, these um, Allens, these three, need to come off, or two of them at least. Um, so I put the pulley on, tighten it down, 200 whatever foot-pounds, and uh, something was wrong or something happened, I had to take it off again. Well, I went to loosen these, and they did not move. They were locked on. Well, it turns out these were uh, red Loctited from um, RR Racing. So these uh, snapped off. And I had to use a giant pry bar under here to kind of wiggle this off. And then I cracked the front cover. And uh, eventually I got it off. But it would took an extremely long time because I did not have the proper um, tool. Which is, I made this aluminum bar. Which attaches under these hex bolts. So you remove the hex bolts, put this on. This will lock the crank in place so you can tighten and loosen your, your crank bolt. So just aluminum stock, thicker. That's your new crank holding tool just for this pulley. Okay, so here's your ATI super damper. These three hex bolts here um, should come off because you need, in order to tighten the main crank bolt to 200 whatever, 40 foot pounds, um, this is kind of the tool you need. I made this, it's just aluminum stock, two holes in it, space ground out for the crank bolt in the middle. Uh, but basically we have to take two of these off, put the tool on, the tool holds the crank, then we can loosen the uh, main crank bolt. So these should be blue Loctited. I don't know if it's necessary, um, but obviously in order to get loosen the bolt, you have to take these off. Um, I mentioned earlier I had a sequence of unfortunate events um, where... I think initially these um, these smaller hex bolts around that are flush with the pulley they um, they came loose because they were not Loctited. Those have to be Loctited. They should be technically um, I think they're red from what our racing said because this should really never come off of the aluminum pulley behind it. But my problem was <clears throat> this front pulley was wobbling heard like a rattling noise look down the pulley was wobbling well these bolts uh were loose so they must have forgot to lock tight them at all from uh our racing so i gave him a call and shipped it back i don't know if the something was damaged in here um just due to the the how the pulley was wobbling it might have damaged something but one way or another i had to i think i had to send it back and i got it back installed it and then Turns out these these hex, these big ones I'm removing now were actually red Loctited in. So I snapped one, two, I snapped all of them. And I had no way 
of loosening the crank bolt, uh, I think I eventually like just blasted off with an impact. I removed radiator and everything. Um, but then I couldn't get the pulley off of the crankshaft. Alright, so we've got two of them off. Now we're going to install two of them back on. And you could also remove the radiator, obviously, and uh, stick an impact on there. It would probably come off, but if you're just using tools, hand tools, you're going to have to somehow hold the crank. And I bumped the camera again. Okay. And I lost my 8mm socket. Nope, there it is. Uh, so whatever I was saying, uh, you have to loosen it one way or the other. But I'll get into the next issue I had um, after this point. So tighten this down. Boom, there's your custom ATI holder. Uh, this can just go on the oil filter housing. I've done it before, and that's kind of what RR Racing recommends um, to hold everything in place while you loosen that. So get your favorite big breaker bar on there and 22 mm millimeter socket. Ah, that is on there. Woo! Ah. There we go. Cracked her loose. And I'm not sure if the crank bolt has any thread locker on it. I don't think so, but holy cow. Okay. Two big pulls and then a crack loose. Now you can switch to your smaller half inch ratchet. And we will verify if this in fact has thread locker on it or not. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, does not. So it's dry, um, installed and torqued. Now the problem is, how do we get that pulley off of there? Um, well, that was the, the other issue I had. So when I got the pulley back, these, these bigger hexes were red, thre uh, red and thread locked and they snapped. Well, that wasn't an issue to get the, the bolt off, but now how do you attach your crank pulley puller to the crank and properly get the pulley off of um, the timing cover, or the crankshaft? These are all flush, these are broken, it's done. What do you do? So I spent a significant amount of time with a huge breaker bar under here, left and right, and I ended up cracking the front timing cover here due to that because this is on there in a way that it's not like the stock pulley where it somewhat easily comes off. It's a much tighter fit on here. Um, but eventually I got it off. I had to send it back because it was all damaged and marred up um, because these were snapped off flush. So needless to say, got it back again and... So these smaller ones are blue, loctited, or red, because technically this shouldn't come off. And then these bigger ones should just be blue loctited, so you can do what we just did there. So they fixed it, sent me a new one. This is when I did the timing chains and the tensioners and everything. That's why I had to get it off um, again. Uh, so now with these three bolt holes, we can attach our puller and then stick our um, puller in here and then tighten it down and it'll, it'll pull the pulley off all in one piece. Now, you're gonna need a bolt type wheel puller set. And what that's gonna enable you to do is stick this contraption over the pulley and attach your three bolts again that we just removed. And then we can properly push on the center and that will push our pulley off. 
Don't forget your little thing at the end of the, you know, that goes in first, obviously. So it'll look something like this, like a big, uh, you know what, and then that kind of goes in there. And that was the problem I had initially because imagine my frustration when <laughs> there are no um, open bolt holes and things are broken flush and they're red loctited in and you can't get a drill in there and it's just a bad situation. So I'm going to stick that on now and really we can use our same bolts that we just uh, removed. I can figure out where I put them. There we go. Um, I don't know if it matters. If, I mean, we can stick the, the hole down, I guess. I don't remember which way I did it initially. Five years ago or whenever that was. And this is the same process for any ATI type, like fluid damper um, on any car, really. Because you don't want to, you don't want to pry anywhere on here on these edges. I mean, you're gonna bend it, break it. It's not a good situation, and things will be out of, out of balance. So I was gonna leave this on, but I forgot. Obviously, you need it with the supercharger kit, and I got somebody interested already in the supercharger kit. So unfortunately, this is gonna go with it. And this doesn't have to be on extremely tight. I mean, it's just. You know, hand tight is fine, and so all you're doing is just holding this plate here. And I will show you how lovely this is. So that's in there, and I definitely forgot to install. <laughs> I gotta take it off again. I forgot to install this in there first. All right, got her back on, and for this side, you can actually just use a 14 millimeter wrench. Fits on there pretty nicely. And don't forget to take off the serpentine belt. That's a 14 millimeter on the uh, pulley, uh, and you pull it uh, clockwise to loosen the belt. And you can just remove the belt from here and stick it up on. Oh, you can see it through that glare, but. There's a drain, cool rubber drain line on the overflow bottle. You can just stick it up there, it'll hold it for you. Now, I should really get a ratcheting, uh, I'm gonna take my ratcheting wrench off my serpentine thing. See, it just fell on me now. It's all right, it's much easier from below. You don't have to remove like the overflow tank and all that. Um, now, if you stick your finger or something against the timing cover while you do this you can feel the gap increasing and it's just coming off perfectly without any issues and imagine trying to pry right here all you're doing is forcing the pulley kind of on an angle like it's never going to come off and honestly i i don't know how i got it off but somehow i got it off without without a puller which is just insane. All right, I can fit my whole finger now in here. Let's keep on tightening. Obviously, if it tightens up or feels weird, or you can't feel this gap increasing, you got a problem you gotta address, but it'll get easier, easier. And eventually this thing will just pop off. And you don't have to remove the radiator, you don't have to remove the shroud, nothing. All hand tools, love it. I'm not like anti air tool or electric ratchet, but this is just how I grew up and what I used. So I'm used to it. And it keeps your muscles big in your arms. Ah, oh, almost there now. We've got almost two finger gap now here between the, oops, hit the camera again, unfortunately. Right there. Just keep on going. And you'll feel it eventually just pop off the crank like so boom okay uh, let me get this out of here and then 
we'll look at it more in detail. Okay, here you can see our tool removed. Did the job perfectly. Drops in like that. I'm gonna lose, leave these bolts loose for the next guy so you can put thread locker on there uh, if he so chooses. These are super cool. I like the ATIs. They are more expensive, but they seem like a better built product. And it tells you like how to install it. Um, you know, what should have Loctite. Do not use three jaw puller. That's important because again, you'll bend the flanges. Um, let's see here. Uh, it gives you an ATI puller. So if you want the actual ATI uh, puller, there's a part number on there. Torque the bolts to 16 foot pounds and the other ones to 28 foot pounds. Blue Loctite required. So, like I said, these had red and they snapped off. We're beyond that. Uh, damper is zero balance. Do not drill. Rear weight for external balance dampers may be drilled. So, looks like you can drill the back somewhere. Maybe in between here. I don't know. I don't drill dampers. When to rebuild. So, this is important. Circle track and endurance use. Rebuild with each engine rebuild. Street and drag up to 800 horsepower. Rebuild every 10 years and above 800 horsepower and blown or nitrous racing. Rebuild damper every year. So that's crazy. Technically, this should be rebuilt. But I've had one on my 1,000 horsepower Mirage for, I don't know, 10 years and it's fine. So maybe I'll send it in when I pull the engine and see if they do an analysis on it. So the unit itself, pretty cool. Obviously, this is all aluminum and then it... it mates to the the supercharger um, damper on front compared to the original which is heavier and steel and rubber kind of pressed together and a lot of times you not often but you will get failures where this separates um, from the actual pulley itself and some pulleys have they don't have this outside mass it's kind of all in one so the rubber is inside of this the actual pulley and that's why on normal V8s and like the LS430, you don't have this thing, uh, which is why the tool fits. And I'll, I'll show you the tool. I think it's, uh, I'll go grab that so you can see it. So the tool is the Toyota Lexus Harmonic Damper Pulley Holder 2237 CTA Tools. Here's what it looks like. Basically, you put a, a breaker bar on this end or just let this rest wherever it sits. And this drops inside of here. But like I said, it's not deep enough to do that. And obviously this doesn't work for this because, yeah. So this works great on LS430s, um, other Toyotas. Um, it's, it's perfect because it actually, you know, it fits and then you just bolt it to there and then boom, that's your holder. So that's it for that. Let's get the old one on and I'll show you how easy that is. All right, so on your crankshaft, you have a Woodruff key. Luckily for us, it's directly on top, so it's not going to fall out. But you want that key kind of angled. It kind of sits in there like a, um, you know, it rotates a little bit. It's flat on the top. It's got like a, a half moon shape on the bottom that drops in the crankshaft and locates the pulley. It does not hold the pulley to the crank. The bolt and the torque holds it. So you want to make sure it's kind of angled down so this pulley is just going to slide on. It's not going to fight the key. So all we got to do then is put our factory pulley back on, align that hole for the Woodruff key on top. And it's forgiving. I mean, it's a little forgiving. It'll uh, find itself and then you can kind of feel it locate on there. And that's it, it's on. So now really all you gotta do is put the bolt in, start tightening it, and then it'll pull itself into the crankshaft. Very easy. And like I said, on these, the stock ones, you can actually use a pry bar on the bottom because the, the fit itself is a lot more loose compared to the um, RR Racing or the aftermarket one, ATI, whatever. So you're good wiggling it, it'll, it'll wiggle its way off with a um, pry bar. So that's it. Here's our new, or used, or old, or whatever, bolt with the big washer. This we're going to stick right on here, start threading it, tighten it down to, I think it's 240, I want to say 247 foot-pounds if I'm wrong. Let me know, but I'll check that before I torque it down. 
but we're just going to tighten that down like a normal uh, bolt and it will it'll pull itself onto the crank which is exactly what we want to do same thing you can stick your finger under here make sure it's coming down onto the timing cover and then uh, like I said you'll feel it kind of pulling itself down and you'll it'll put pressure on your finger against the timing cover and that'll tell you that it's on the, the Woodruff key correctly and all is good in the world so it is in fact the bolt is actually getting looser because it's pulling it down and my fingers about to get pinched so I'm gonna remove that and keep tightening this down until it's well, oops I don't know what is with me hitting my camera all the time it's just always in the way all right this is super loose I mean you do it with one finger and eventually it's gonna get tight here yeah right there and that's our key to uh, drop a 3 8 extension in there and get her torqued down uh, but before we do that I'm gonna put the belt on just so it gives us a little extra um, pull on the crankshaft pulley or a little extra resistance I should say and then one more important thing I'm gonna mention is uh, let's see here what's the easiest way to do this so the belt goes under AC pulley over this flat thing on top which is the scavenger oil pump on the right uh, water pumps gonna be up on the left here idler pulley upper right corner and we're gonna kind of work it around here not like that you don't want the belt on the tensioner because that's going to move. Let's see if we get this down here. That's that. That's that. That's nice and tight. So the last thing we need the belt around our tensioner. Uh, right there. Come on. There you go. Okay, so I'm going to hold the belt with one finger. And hopefully... This will work how I want it to. Oh, that's tight. One, two, three. There we go. Whew. Okay, tensioner's on. Which you probably didn't even see at all because the camera's not up there. Sorry about that. Here's our tensioner. Belt's on. And that's on there. Now you can see... We can't tighten the bolt because it spins the crank. So, all right. So, per our racing instructions, you have to drop a 3 8 extension inside one of those holes. And uh, take a look at that. Hopefully, you can see that. Uh, that's apparently going to hold the crank while we torque it so let me try that all right we're almost there 242 foot pounds or, or pound feet or whatever that's the official uh torque rating so here we go final one ah oh, there we go i'm super like scared about sticking a three ace extension to hold the crank pulley because you're essentially if you can see like I mentioned before the uh, um, JB weld right there just from the, the prying the, the R racing pulley off but you can see where the 3 a sits to loosen or tighten to loosen it's gonna be on the opposite side the right side but ah, man I don't know that is just what happens if you tighten it too much and it cracks the front cover? You're screwed. But it held, so we're good. Now I gotta fish. <laughs> Don't forget to fish this out of here. Always have some problems. But that's it. So last thing, um, very important to tighten this to 242 because the torque specs of this bolt essentially hold your entire engine together. If this is loose. This pulley comes off. It's not just a pulley coming off, it's the crank that's being damaged, it's the timing chain. There's two timing chain sprockets behind the front cover. 
if those come loose, it's going to destroy your crankshaft, your timing is going to go, your valves are going to bend, it's, it's going to be a very bad situation. So it's one bolt, 240 foot-pounds, holds everything inward together. Very important you understand that. Probably the most important thing of this engine, honestly. Um, yeah, we can go into more detail, but if you watch my timing chain videos, it'll, it'll kind of show all the parts and the damage that I found. So I suggest you go watch those. And uh, I'm going to drop this down, and I think we just got some final things to do before we can start it up and uh, make sure it runs. This, I think, is one of the most interesting and important parts of the supercharger system. Um, it is the fuel, the fuel pickup. So here's a little plug I, I pulled off a second ago. This is just going to give us some more room. So you can see everything in here. Okay, there we go. We'll get this out of the way. Now, you'll see you have two factory lines here. Um, one of these is obviously the, the pickup, and then one is the uh, return. So your various lines here, um, one's obviously going to be the, um, the overflow from the surge tank, so anything excess is just going to get dumped back into the, this fuel tank. And then you have your um, pickup, and then there's probably a, a vent, and then the return, or um, this, this is probably the pressure from the surge tank that connects to the factory line, and then it shoots to the front of the car that makes sense so then this is what goes to your fuel injectors so you're basically your original fuel pump here turns into a low pressure basically feed pump and then the surge tank is your new um, you know fuel source so this is safety wired here you see I just cut that that's so this doesn't just fall off of this connector because it's just press fit so let's get that out of the way. We don't need this anymore because we no longer are supercharged. Um, and then obviously if you are supercharged, going supercharged, this is your um, kind of documentary or guide step by step on how to set this up. Um, I kind of varied a little bit from RR Racing's directions just because I thought this was the cleaner kind of way to do it. Um, but basically, let's see here. I don't know why this one's loose. It's kind of weird. So this, like I said, it'll just, it's just friction fit. So that's a fitting. And then this, I'm not sure where, I don't know if there's a fitting missing or if, oh, I think this just plugs in. Uh, hopefully this just plugs into this spot here. We'll see. And you'll have to jack up the car to kind of pull the, or feed the, the hoses up in here and then kind of curl them around so they don't kink all right so that one's out we can just uh, put this this way for now and now what we want to do is pull this yellow there's two yellow connectors these slide out and then your fitting just pops out so it's really easy you don't have to mess around with like rusted fittings or anything how we used to have back in the 90s just all plastic and o-rings so it's super nice all right this one is just about out giving me a problem here i don't want to break them or lose them oh that was close so there's our fitting here. It's just a clip that literally holds, oops, that holds the this fitting into the pump housing. So here's your pickup. This is where it feeds the surge tank, like I said, and then here's the overflow. And then the line that we just got rid of is the old feed from the pump. So now what we can do is if we want to revert back to factory, there's a line under here that's kind of messing with how this is sitting. I think that goes under that. Yeah, it makes 
more sense. So now what we have to do is simply plug this back in to the factory slot and we're back to factory again. Look at that. Now we can pull the surge tank out, sell it, throw it away, whatever. And then this just simply locks in the same way we got it out of there. Boom, done. Now what I'm gonna do is pull this off and then just cap this fitting. So we don't have to replace the $300 um, housing. Uh, we just cap this fitting with the AN cap and then we're basically done. Okay, got a couple AN caps there. One looks too small, but the other one should work. And then I'm just gonna loosen this top line. And that's it. So that'll basically go like that and then just cap this off. Um, yeah, this is just your through fitting so you can get fluid back into it. But I mean, effectively, you put that on and it's the same as having the line on there it's sealed up. And then the cap should still fit over that, no problem. Um, so now I think I'm going to take off some of these fittings so it's easier to pull the lines that way, otherwise they might catch. But basically, uh, you, know, you saw the setup, you saw how it's hooked up, and that's it. So we'll go into the surge tank next. Here is our surge tank. You can see the lines go through the floor here, and there's actually a seam sealer that seals them to the... the sheet metal. So these are in there permanently. This is not um, screwed in obviously because I didn't want to screw through carpet and then screw through the sheet metal because obviously at some point in time I knew I was going to be removing all this and selling the setup. So no it's not secure but it doesn't really matter. I mean you might get it hitting on there occasionally but you know, up to you. You can also zip tie this to the lines. Like, it's not, it's not a big deal. If you're doing some heavy duty racing autocross, I would definitely secure it. But for street driving, you know, whatever. So, um, built into this is our fuel pressure regulator. So that's pretty cool. Um, like I said before, if on E85 on the stage three kit, you're at about 70 psi, and if you want to just drain the tank and run 93 in winter or not gum up anything um, you know while the car's in storage you can turn this regulator down to about 45 psi and then run 93 octane so here is the plug very simply just unscrews and pulls out I'll get rid of that later and what I like to do is just put a giant towel because if you use paper towels or something and there's a fuel leak um, it's not going to soak it up and then you'll have gas on your carpet in the trunk and it's not good most of these though should be drained because we just unhooked them from the sender side so with that ready um, we'll start loosening these okay i've just loosened the fittings enough with a tool that i can do them by hand now so see this one's dry all our fuel is already gone this one little drop Oh, I see there's some fuel in there. And this top one here. That one's also dry. So this thing is full. Keep that in mind. So you want to lift this carefully out of here. As to not spill any fuel that's inside of it. And get it outside of the car. Okay. Now, what I'm going to have to do is probably cut these lines to get them I don't want to do that though I'll probably have to cut them to get them back down there because I fed them up without the fittings on it so unfortunately yeah we might have to cut these a little bit short just to pull them back through I guess that's just how it is and then this thing I will uh, remove the cover and then snip it and then just stick that with the surge tank so let me figure out what I'm gonna do and then um, 
I'll pull these through and then we'll jack up the car and then I'll show you kind of the routing of where this has to go um, to get to the fuel sender. And then here you can see under the carpet how it's all basically seam sealed. So this is, I mean this is as good as factory. It's not going anywhere and that's not silicone. It's going to take a little bit of work to get this cut out of there. Alright, just to give you an idea, <clears throat> your lines are going to come right straight through there. You see that little pipe up there, which I think is EVAP or something. And your, your hoses will come straight in that area. They're going to wrap up over the subframe. And then they're going to drop down here. Right there. And then they'll go to the top of the fuel tank. So, of course, I did not make the holes large enough to fit the fittings, only the hose. So I have no way of getting these fittings out. Uh, I tried to pull on them, they didn't come out. I'm going to try a vice grips, I guess, and then try to unscrew them from the hose, but I don't know, we'll see that I can pull the hose down, but yeah, this is kind of your routing, just so you know. And uh, that's pretty much it. So you saw the pump, you saw the surge tank, and uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Alright, this is the unfortunate end of the ISF. We've got the factory wheels back on the back. The car is running. Put in a few gallons of 93 octane so we can kind of get rid of the E85. Um, I've got two caps coming for this because I'm leaving the um, valve cover vents just venting to atmosphere because we don't want oily vapor coming back in here anyways factory air box is back in I've got the engine cover still uh, I turned the fuel pressure down to 40 uh, 50 ish it was 70 um, this is the way you can run 93 octane on the stage 3 um, fuel setup, which are the larger injectors. Um, turning down the pressure allows you to run 93. You're not supposed to boost on it, but just to get around. Um, you know, sands having an actual 93 pump tune you can load on the car. You crank the fuel pressure way down and then it runs fine on 93. So I'm going to pull all this out. These hoses, the E85 gauge or the sensor. And uh, if our racing sends me, I asked for a stock tune that just deleted the rear O2 sensor codes. If they do, I'll swap in the stock injectors and then that's that. I mean, we won't have to worry about drivability, period. Um, but yeah, that's it. It's ready to go. Um, yeah, it's just kind of sad. Sad situation, sad time. I don't really want to get rid of it, but it's like... It's not supercharged anymore and it's stock and it's like blah and I'm just over it. So this is up for sale. I've got the ES up for sale, the manual trans ES300. Um, I've actually got some other cool stuff coming from Japan. So watch out for that. All right, here it is. Bev's like stock starts like stock um, 85 is still showing 59% usually it takes a few miles or 10 minutes or so for that to kick in and drop down with the 93 octane we just put in TPMS light is on I'm not sure why I put on the other let's try this put on the other wheels with the sensors so Hopefully that shuts off. It should be on this one of these. I don't remember which one it is, but one's the slicks and then one's the regular set of tires. Maybe it's that one. I don't know. But yeah, that's it. That's all we got. We just got to top off the coolant. I got to get this gauge out of here and uh, a few other odds and ends under the bumper. Put that back together and then we're done. So thanks for watching. If you want the car, let me know. If you don't want the car, let me know. Um, 
but hopefully if you were installing a supercharger removing a supercharger this video helped for that um, but that's it till next time see ya